Let's imagine that all translators have heard my lecture yesterday and are now prepared to admit that they really don't know the meanings or the sense of what they're translating. You're going to confess to each other within the kitchen of our workspace that we, we're not really sure. Don't tell the readers, don't tell the clients, don't tell the audience, don't tell anybody using your software that you had doubts. But just between us, there are doubts. And I asked yesterday, how do you live with that? How do you deal with it? And there are many ways. If you go back now and look at the theories I've been talking about, we can start to see them as ways of dealing with indeterminacy. Okay? One way, which is obvious to all, is, is pretending you're very professional. <laughs> now, I'm not joking. I, okay, years ago, when the internet was just being used professionally, I would always make a point of delivering my final translation to the client in person. I put on it. This is where I learned the, the virtues of a suit and tie. You know? Uh, you know the product's bad, you know there are doubts, but if you look confident and you look good, people will believe you. Okay, that works for interpreters as well, even though they're hidden back behind the booth. Uh, when the client sees them, if they look like they're professional, their work is likely to be trusted. Do not tell the client that your work cannot be trusted because you're full of doubts. Okay. But this is part of what professionalism is. The sociology of professions, the contemporary sociology, looks at professions not as fields of expertise or of special skills, professions, lawyers, engineers, architects, but fields of discourse, technical terms, technical expressions, ways of acting that exclude others and create a mystique of expertise. Everybody, every profession, has its ways of pretending that they are certain. Translation, interpreting, localization are perhaps no different. The final way of dealing with indeterminacy that I, I mentioned in passing yesterday is um, codification. Making everything into a rule. Uh, control. Don't look at the one thing that is uncontrolled, which is language, but control everything else that you can. So this is the way the localization paradigm has developed and has come into translation. Uh, and its basic proposition is that in order to do a translation, you go through a whole lot of steps. It's like that Guadec model I showed you. With the pre-translation, you get the text, you decompose it, you check it. You, uh, where everything is controlled in a workflow process such that translation is a very small, unimportant moment. I remember criticizing one of the localization theorists many years ago. Quite an important man, actually. And he had this brilliant workflow model. And he had to translate. And he had to be careful. Some languages have different syntax. The whole, the whole of Chomsky sort of fits into this little warning. You know, the whole of linguistics is there. But it was the least important thing for him. The, the, the important thing was getting a job done and getting paid and getting it checked by everybody. And this little linguistic thing, you know, <coughs> translators will sort that out. It's a huge thing that the localization paradigm tends to reduce. And perhaps, just perhaps, allows equivalence to return. Okay, I want to frame localization. localization. It's a term that's come to us in the era of globalization. And it's not a mistake. If I'm asking myself, why a new term? Why localization? Why didn't it happen in the 19th, 18th, 17th century? Why can't I find a term like localization in, in the thought of prior centuries? The reason would have to be uh, globalization. Globalization in the crude sense of uh, marketing a product to many different cultures in many different languages. Do you know where this phrase comes from? All that is solid melts into air. It's a beautiful phrase. Zen. 
Zen philosophy? Zen could be Zen philosophy if that's your aim to melt into it. It's also, well, let's, let's continue with it. All that is holy is profaned. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products, Microsoft selling all over the world. Miss selling all over the world, getting you to come here for more. Chasers are the bourgeoisie, the, the merchant class. Over the entire surface of the globe, it must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. Microsoft is everywhere. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to the production and consumption <coughs> in every country. That would be a fair description, I think, of globalization. Okay, that we are no longer working. The, the economy is not functioning on a national level in any closed way. Where's it from? No. The world is flat. Sorry? The world is flat, maybe? The world is flat. I've never read it, but maybe it <laughs> could, could be there. <laughs> so it's Karl Marx, I know it's Karl Marx, okay, well before anything, the kind of globalization that we're talking about now, which is supposed to have developed in the 60s and 70s, uh, it was already picked up in the, in the early 19th century, when uh, global trade started to emerge, and the products people consumed were not produced around the corner, or by people they knew. And, and the products we produce were not going to people we knew. There's this anonymity in the uh, economic exchange relationship uh, that creates a sense of inauthenticity. All that is solid melts into it. I used to know where I was living and the people I was talking with. Now I have to communicate with all these people and I don't know anything about them. The process of globalization technically, and now in the economic sense, developed in the second half of the 20th century, is due to some very simple facts. You lower the cost of communication and transport. It's cheaper to move. What happens? More people move, more things move. So there's more trade. Trade goes across cultures. When this happens, you tend to get areas of specialization within an economic system. And it so happens that intellectual production tends to come into central nodes in the most developed parts of the economic system, and pure consumption is on the periphery. And you get a, a system that works in terms of center and periphery. The center is where technologies are developed to further reduce the cost of communication and transport, to make better computers, better software, better anything. And those technologies are fed out to the periphery, which increasingly supplies the labor to actually make the products. Ideas move out, things move in. Some cultures are reduced to receiving the ideas and the technology in central languages and producing products by hand uh, and uh, consuming as best they can. Translation in this kind of world tends to move not equally between locations or economies or countries or languages. It moves from the center to the periphery. <coughs> Logically, because that's the way the ideas and the technologies move. Why is it that you are all translating from English into or from your languages into English. Why is English such a central language? Because it's the center of the globalized economy. Sorry, used to be. You, you will test this. In the second hour, you will test this idea. But the theory is that uh, translation enters into this mode of globalization as something that moves predominantly from center to periphery and much less from periphery to center. 
And you can check out the statistics on translation flows, and that is fairly clear. Within the center, the languages of the center thereby extend beyond their regions of natural or, or L1 use and become uh, lingua francas. This was a process of colonization and, and European imperialism with the European colonial languages. It's now entered a new phase where English has become a super uh, lingua franca, but we're awaiting the next phase when Chinese will be or is becoming the lingua franca of its own region.